Good morning, everyone. I welcome you to online worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. This morning, we're continuing our journey through the season of Pentecost and are going to hear a message from Reverend Dr. Jane Rickey on community and forgiveness. Will you pray with me? Let us pray. Lord, may we know the presence of your Holy Spirit here with us today. May we be open to your leading, sensitive to your speaking, and alert to your calling. We invite the same power at work in your disciples on Pentecost so long ago to be at work in us here and now. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I want to invite you to join us in our opening hymn, Come Christians Join to Sing. As we prepare our hearts for a time of prayer, I want to point out some uh, reminders of our life together as a congregation. First of all, the flowers are given to the glory of God and in honor of the 50th wedding anniversary of Dick and Jean Bankston and in memory of Liam Corville. Uh, the roses honor the birth of Zenobia Clare, child of Chris and Elizabeth Blades, and Robert Gray III, child of Gray and Jennifer Pooh, and grandchild of Phil and Terry Price. And our vote of this morning is in memory of John Meredith. And now as you listen to this offering of music, prepare your hearts for prayer.
The form of prayer that we'll be participating in this morning is a, a form known as a bidding prayer. And uh, I will offer petitions to God, but then I'll leave a time of silence. And you are invited in this time to add your own concerns, your own names that, uh, that relate to the petition that's been said. And I just want to encourage you uh, not to kind of blank out, which we all do sometimes, but to really think about uh, which, uh, which of these concerns uh, are in your heart and to name and lift those before God in those moments of silence. Let us pray. Friends in Christ, God invites us to hold the needs of our sisters and brothers as dear to us as our own needs, loving our neighbors as ourselves. And so we offer our thanksgiving and our petitions on behalf of the church and the world. For the earth, that we may be good stewards of her resources. For our nation, state, and community, for its leaders and welfare. For the church and its mission and ministry in the world, and in particular, for the concerns of this congregation. For victims of violence, fear, injustice, and oppression, and all those who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit, and especially for those who are ill with or who have died from COVID-19. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. And now in this next moment of silence, I just invite you to lift whatever is on your heart before God. Lord, hear our prayers that we may love you with our whole being and live in love and concern for our neighbors. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, I'd like to welcome our children uh, and invite even those who are young at heart around as they hear a special message from Miss Serena. Good morning, friends. It's so great to see you today. Have you ever gotten in a fight or an argument with a brother or sister or a friend, and you found that it was really hard to forgive them for what they had done wrong? Well, in today's scripture, we're going to hear one of Jesus's friends, Peter, ask him a really important question about forgiveness. And he asked Jesus, when somebody does something wrong, should I forgive them seven times? And get this, Jesus said, no, not just seven times, but 70 times seven times. Whoa, that sounds like a huge number. So I brought my calculator with me so I could do the math. 70 times seven. 
oh my gosh, that's 490. Can you imagine that? Forgiving somebody 490 times? That seems almost impossible. Do you think Jesus really meant for us to sit there and count out each and every time we forgive somebody every time they do something wrong? Well, not quite. What I really think Jesus was trying to explain to us is that we have to forgive over and over and over and over again. Because, after all, that's what God does for us. Each and every day, we make mistakes too, and God forgives us over and over and over again. And Jesus' greatest commandment to us was to love one another. And so our greatest way to show love to one another is to forgive over and over and over. And friends, that's not an easy thing to do. We're not going to be able to do that on our own. So we ask for the Holy Spirit to help us, to help us make those tough choices that even when we're hurt, that we forgive over and over and over. And we could read our Bibles and see the stories of Jesus living his life and showing forgiveness to other people too. And we ask God to help us along the way as well. So let's do that right now. God, thank you so much for this illustration that Jesus gave us in his life and in his numbers. 490 seems crazy, but we know we have to forgive over and over and over and much more than 490 times. Help us to do that today and every day in order to show your love. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, have a great week, friends. Bye. So in this time of anxiety and divisions in our nation and really in our culture, I think there's no more profound act that we can do than to share the peace of Christ with one another. So I want to invite you to pass the peace of Christ with those who might be in your own household with you uh, or and extend that invitation to other people via text message on social media, however you want to do that. Peace be with you. So I want to continue to invite you to interact with us in a variety of ways and let you know some things that are happening in the life of our congregation. Uh, first thing I want to point out is uh, no matter where you're watching us, if you're watching us on our online church platform, on Facebook, on YouTube, wherever that might be, you'll find a variety of interactive options. Uh, one we want to invite you to is to fill out a connection card, and that's just sharing with us your name, maybe your email address, and letting us know that you're watching this morning. Uh, if you're watching with the, for the very first time or joining us for the first time, we want to say welcome. We're really glad that you chose to worship online with First United Methodist Church. But take a moment, let us know you're here, and, and welcome. The other option you'll see is an option to request prayer, and we are continuing to lift your concerns before God in prayer. And so if you want to take a moment and fill out one of uh, those uh, tabs there or one of those links, we invite you to do that. You'll also see an option on the online church platform to jo join in live prayer, and that's a little chat room, and one of our pastors or prayer intercessor will, intercessor will meet you there to pray with you if you need that at this time. So I also want to encourage you to continue to remember first. United Methodist Church uh, in your uh, practice of generosity. We are continuing to do the work of the church, even as we are physically distanced from one another. We're continuing to worship. We're continuing to offer classes in groups. We're continuing to disciple people, continuing to serve. Uh, and we do need your gifts to continue those ministries. And so you'll see the option to be able to give online, uh, to text your gift, or to mail a check if you prefer to do it that way. So we began a few weeks ago some midweek prayer services on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 12 noon and 6 p.m., and we're going to continue those this week, uh, and we do ask that if you want to attend one of those that you make a reservation as we continue to try to just monitor the number of people that are, will be on our campus. And I'm also excited to announce that we'll be beginning in-person Sunday morning worship beginning next Sunday, June 21st. And we've made the decision that we are going to continue to ask you all to make reservations for those services. So uh, at uh, phase two, we're allowed to expand the capacity a little bit in the sanctuary. And so we're going to try to limit it to 200 people. Uh, this space holds some uh, well, well over 850 people. And so 200 people in here are really able to spread out pretty broadly. Uh, but we do want to ask you to make a reservation. And if you go to the church's website, you'll see the link for that. And then we're going to be doing our America Street service, which is our contemporary service at 945 in the gym, and we're going to limit that service to 75. And with the number of people who are still choosing to stay home or who need to stay home for medical reasons, uh, we're confident that we'll be able to accommodate everyone who wants to come. And so I look forward to seeing you all in person as we resume worship together.
And I want to make sure that you know that we're going to continue to stream our services for those who choose or even need to stay home. And so uh, we look forward to worshiping together in, in all of those ways. Last thing I want to let you know is that this morning you're going to hear a message from Reverend Dr. Jane Rickey, and uh, we announced in an email a few weeks ago that uh, Reverend Rickey will be retiring at the end of June, and she has uh, been uh, faithfully serving here at First United Methodist Church for two years. We've really been blessed by her ministry and her presence, uh, but the two years here are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of her, uh, her ministry. Uh, she has served as a, a pastor in the United Methodist Church for 36 years and has served 14 different congregations. Uh, it's an amazing uh, testimony to her, to her ministry and serving the Lord. So I want to invite you to do something. Uh, we're going to put Jane's email address up on the screen, and I want to encourage you uh, just to, to uh, send her a, a message or a note about how much her ministry has meant to you, whether you're here from First Methodist over the last two years or whether you've known her for, for a lifetime. And also, uh, if you want to send her a card or any kind of gift, we would encourage you to send it to the church. We'll put the church's uh, address there on the on the screen, and we will get those cards and gifts to her uh, when they come in. And uh, we're going to ask a blessing over Reverend Ricky at the end of our service, but I just want to encourage you to write her those notes, uh, send her those cards of thanks for her work with us and her work for God. Let's pray together over our offering. Let's pray. God of compassion, Sometimes we are reluctant to place our entire trust in you. We feel more secure trusting in our own abilities and our own strengths. And so we thank you for this time in worship when we're reminded that it is your unwavering, steadfast love and provision that sustain us. So we ask you to bless these gifts. I ask your blessing on those who give them. Help us to trust ever more deeply in your grace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The gospel is taken from the 18th chapter of Matthew, the 21st and 22nd verses. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brothers sin against me, and I forgive them? As many as seven times. I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reading the news these past two weeks, my heart has been troubled. The sins of the past have collided with the trauma of the present. Fury and frustration fueled by the fire that burned within for too long has erupted. What was witnessed by so many around the world cannot be unseen. Change is going to happen. And so I ask myself in the midst of this time of disruption, what will our communities do with the knowledge of such trauma inflicted over a national history of 400 years? How can we breach that chasm between us? With that in my heart and on my mind, I looked to the scriptures, and what I found was an idea of who we are, who we are meant to be, and who we are asked to become. The answer to who we are begins with God and understanding the source of community. From the very beginning, before the earth's creation, God existed. One God in three persons, the creator, the Christ, and the sustainer, or in other terms, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is a Greek icon, which I love very much and have had in my office for many years. The icon depicts the Trinity. Within the icon, there are three entities. Many see them as angels gathered around a common table. Each angel is facing one another, each looking toward one another you're given the impression that they have always been that way, that they have always shared in community. They represent the three in one in community and relationship with one another. They are one, full, complete, never alone, and always a part of one another. When we sing in our liturgy, glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, we acknowledge that God has always been and always will be God in three persons, one. Complete, yet still yearning for relationship. The creation of humanity was God's answer. It's not surprising then to learn Jesus lived in community, from his childhood with Mary and Joseph to his baptism as a, an adult in the midst of a crowd, to the gathering of disciples, his declaration that he and the Father were one. Jesus lived within and desired community. It was with community of friends that Jesus traveled and ate, told stories, healed people, and showed God's love and forgiveness to all. Yet community is much more. Remember Jesus' revolutionary promise that wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there? This is a welcome promise to those if, that wonder if God is present in their lives. This is a hopeful promise for those who may feel alone and forsaken. And this is an enormous assurance for those who face the unknown. 
or need companionship and community to see them through the storms of life. Regardless of the circumstances, when we gather with others and community, Christ is present to heal, to encourage, to soothe, to bring peace. It isn't any surprise then that people coming together from a variety of backgrounds, traditions, histories, and neighborhoods develop community, the community known as the church. We are often blessed by being in the faith community. We receive encouragement, guidance, comfort, and hope by participating in it. Our faith is strengthened here. We find grace and restoration here. We find compassion and love here. The community of faith is where we learn the language of love. Do you remember in the Gospel of John how Jesus tells the disciples, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you shall love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And then in John's first letter to the churches, he wrote, for this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Little children, let us not love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Loving one another as God loves us is who we are meant to be. The Christian community is not a result of human effort, but the result of God's effort. The initiative belongs with God, and He is the source of our life together. Through Christ, we are one people stretching out through all the generations. And in this sense, the community of God is not only a gift, it is holy. That is, it, its source is not in us. Our desire to be in community emanates from God. Two weeks ago, I was uh, the liturgist in our first week of weekday prayer services. Everyone, as you can imagine, wore masks. It was strange to look out into the congregation and not see people's faces. All we saw were their eyes, and all they saw of us were our eyes. We're used to, as humans, looking at people's faces to understand who they are, to understand their emotions, to realize what is going on inside of them, especially as pastors. But I could not see the faces, and they could not see mine. And I felt a loss. I felt a loss of community. For me, it was it was just not seeing one's faces. It was the loss of being able to, to sing, to hug, to shake hands, to show signs of caring to one another. I suddenly realized in that moment how I have become dependent on the interaction that I've had throughout my ministry with the people I've served. Perhaps you too have felt that loss among your friends, your family, all the people that you've come to love and know. But it's more than the loss of a handshake or a, a hug. It's the weight also of this plague that has no end in sight. It's the unrest of protesters. It's the collective grief we feel for the loss of over 116,000 lives. It's the sense of fear instead of safety that many have when seeing the flashing light and the blue lights and hearing the sirens, it's the lost jobs, the lost businesses, and the lost futures of young people. Our life together and who we thought we were is broken. What was has disappeared. What we shall be, we do not know. Yet we do know, 
Today's gospel reading beckons us to look inside ourselves concerning how we might bring healing to our community and to our country. How we might begin again. How we might restore our brothers and sisters' dignity and honor. How we might forgive one another, reconcile with one another, and live in peace with one another. How we might honor God's given gift that community can be. The mother of a young preschooler had just picked up her daughter from school, and she had a lot of errands to take part in before she went home to fix dinner. She first went to the post office to get her mail. And as she reached into her mailbox, there was a woman that was bent over below her that was getting her mail. And she accidentally brushed the woman's head with her arm. She got her mail, and then she turned, and she began to read her mail. The woman suddenly turned on her as she was about to walk away and head down, rammed her with her head in the stomach. The breath was taken out of this mother's lungs. And the woman said to her, that's payback for what you just did to me. If your child hadn't been here, it would have been much worse. This idea of confrontation, of vengeance and retribution is so dominant that the church's teaching about loving one another is mocked. People say, how can you even begin to think that love will change anything? We know the power of love because we know the power of God's love. We know that God's love for us and Jesus Christ transforms lives. We know that the power of love can change the world because we have witnessed that change in ministries that have transformed communities, water wells where water has not been available, schools where education has been forgotten in favor of survival, health and restoration for the forgotten, and a safe haven for the traumatized. Love in truth and action, as John wrote, can change the world. Now we know that history does repeat itself, and so we learn that the first century was a time in which disputes between people were settled by vengeance and retribution, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That was the Old Testament. But Jesus came to speak a different word, the unrest and the chaos that we see in our country right now seems irreparable. There has been a breach between political parties, immigrants and citizens, those who have and those who don't, the formerly enslaved and those that have always been free. If any healing is to happen in this country, we must recognize and acknowledge those divides and we must be firm and open and sincere about our own need to forgive and to ask for our own forgiveness. If we are to live in community with one another, forgiveness lives, leads to reconciliation, and reconciliation leads to justice, and justice leads to peace and true community. Why? Because Jesus told us so. So reflect on this text this morning as Peter asked Jesus, how often shall my brother sin against me? And can I forgive, how do I forgive him? As many as seven times? Which is a lot of times, seven times. Peter knew that Jesus was going to expect an extra effort beyond what had been taught by the rabbis. It would be more than the three or four that they taught but it would be seven. Peter lived at a time that was outlined by rules. Everything was spilled out. You not only knew what you were supposed to do to forgive a brother or sister or neighbor, but you knew how many times to forgive them. And you knew that there were some people you did not have to forgive. 
those who were outside your family, your kinship circle, those who were foreigners outside of their nation. But your neighbor, your brother and sister, you were to forgive. And you were to forgive them a specific number of times. Knowing what the law required, Peter asked as many as seven times. He real reasoned that if righteousness as Christ followers is to exceed that of the Pharisees, then they ought to do more. I mean, seven seemed the right number. It's more than anyone would ask. Except Jesus said, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times which means forgiveness is unlimited. It is, it is more than we can expect. It's beyond calculation. There are no limits, which means it is not a specific solution to a particular problem in your life, but a way of life. It is the Christian way of life. It is the heart of who we are meant to be and how we live together especially if we value one another, love one another, have compassion upon one another, forgive one another, stand arm in arm with one another, pray for one another, support one another. Kent Ira Goff wrote, a life-giving church is one where human brokenness is lifted up like bread and wine to be held and touched and blessed to heal the world. I brought a chalice with me today that has been used by me many different times for Holy Communion, or perhaps you say the Eucharist, or even the Lord's Supper. The chalice is a symbol of forgiveness for our sins. The chalice is also a symbol of being one people in God through Christ. In the communion service, we remember that the blood of Christ is what redeems us. The chalice is that remember that being one people, holy and forgiven, is how we honor God with the gift of forgiveness then that has been given to us. And we honor the gift of community through that forgiveness. I have been blessed for so many years by the communities that I have known over those 36 years of ministry. Montague, Bellevue, Vashti, Joy, and Louisville, Texas. Wheat Ridge, Wiley, McClave, Denver, Thornton, North Glen, and Loveland, Colorado. And now Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Each community, I have known broken people. Each had problems to solve, wounds to bind up, pain to heal. I experienced, though, how the healing work of God within community, that transformation, takes the old wounds and new life comes. What once was broken is transformed and a new vitality emerged beyond the doors of the church and into the community. A fellowship hall for community gatherings was built. Missionaries were funded. Community meals were served as an outreach to the neighborhood. A health clinic was built. A food pantry created. Tutoring and after-school programs emerged and immigrants were welcomed. The church in community with all around them became a place where all the brokenhearted were healed and new life emerged. And the source of this new vitality was God himself. The spirit of God was the way that all this took place. The source of community, you see, is not within us or what we do or how we say it. Community is from God, and the community of faith is a gift of holy grace to others. It's a gift to the world. It is the witness of the kingdom come on earth. It is who we are, 
asked to become. I hope my point is obvious this morning. For freely you have received, freely give. God has given his faithfulness, his love, and his forgiveness, which is the whole point of the gospel. And you have been dealt graciously with. Now live that way with others. Make graciousness, kindness, forgiveness, faith, a way of life for you. Make your life in community with God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you for that beautiful word, Jane. And uh, as we conclude our time of worship, I want to invite you to a few things. First of all, I want to remind you about the prayer request options uh, that are there. Again, we want to be able to lift those concerns before God in prayer. And I want to invite you to a gathering that we have called Believe and Belong that was actually named by Reverend Ricky. And I think it's such, such a fitting name for what it is. It's a conversation about what it means to have faith in Christ and what it means to be a committed part of the community of faith. And so uh, we believe that the Christian life is best lived out in the context of community, which we just heard about. Uh, and we want to invite you, if you're looking for a church home, to consider making First United Methodist Church that community that you're committed to, to become a member of this church. So if that's something you're interested in, the upcoming dates for Believe and Belong are June 28th and June 30th. And you can contact Karen Milioto. Her information is there on your screen. So uh, I told you earlier that uh, Reverend Ricky will be retiring after 36 years of ministry and two years here at First United Methodist Church. And uh, one of the things that we want to do this morning is ask a blessing over her in, in this time of transition and as she continues into what ministry looks like to her for the future. And so uh, I want to ask you, Jane, if you'll, if you'll stand. And, uh, you know, we do this often when we're in person, but prayer carries over the airwaves and over space and time as well. So wherever you are, will you extend a hand towards Reverend Ricky, Ricky as we ask God's blessing on her? Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for Jane. We thank you for the calling that you placed on her life, uh, for the giftedness that you gave her, and the many ways that she has served you and your people through the years. Lord, we thank you for her time here at First United Methodist Church, uh, for her presence and the way that she has uh, shared her gifts here. And Lord, as she moves into retirement, I know she's not done serving you, that she's already plotting and scheming and has plans about how she will continue uh, to serve and answer your call. But at this time of transition, we do ask your blessing upon her. We ask your blessing upon Brian. Lord, uh, let them know your love. Let them feel uh, your gratitude because I know you're grateful for their service. And Lord, let them feel deep in their hearts and hear those words, well done, good and faithful service, servant. And Lord, we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And at this time, I'd like to invite you to uh, join in our closing hymn, Sent Forth by God's blessing.
hope you will make graciousness, make kindness, make forgiveness, make faith a part of your life, a way of life for you. Make your life in community with God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.